let's take a look at an introduction to diversity. Diversity as a concept has evolved over decades from affirmative action in the United States to present day inclusion strategies to ensure every individual is treated with respect and dignity. Its evolution as a concept and practice has become tumultuous and remains a controversial topic. We can develop an understanding of diversity within the workforce and explore how individuals across different diversity categories like race, gender, age, or class could be disadvantaged as a result of belonging to these groups. Psychological processes such as prejudice, unconscious bias, stereotyping, and microaggression contribute to discriminatory attitudes and behaviors towards diverse individuals in and out of the workplace. There are a variety of theories that help us understand how differences in groups are created, managed, and affected at work. Scholars and practitioners have identified the term diversity in a variety of ways. While narrow definitions mainly focus on race, gender, and so on, broad or expansive de definitions tend to look at both visible and non-visible characteristics and differences in individuals. This includes the traditional categories of race and gender, but also people with disabilities, gender and sexual orientation, and other non-traditional categories such as diversity of thought. Examples of broad or expansive definitions extend to age, personal or corporate background, education, and function as well as personality. What unites both the narrow and broad forms of this definition is the concept of difference. Diversity can be defined as the variety of visible and non-visible differences inherent amongst individuals and groups. Put more simply, diversity is the mix of differences that make a difference. These social characteristics are amongst the dominant diversity strands protected by law in the majority of countries. Theories of diversity are built on social constructivism, universalism, and postmodern and postcolonial insights. Social constructivism assumes that social order is not part of the nature of things. It exists only as a product of human nature, and our perception of reality is based on our social interaction. Simply put, we learn about social categories through our interaction and are given meanings of these categories through our social institutions, such as families and friends. The universalism view has its origins in human rights law and is based on the principle that all human beings share a set of fundamental interests and values that should be protected. Conversely, the cultural relativism perspective is that the world consists of a huge diversity of cultures, standards, and views, which are relative to the culture from which they derive. Postmodern insights stem from the understanding that human understanding alone does not mirror reality. Rather, it's constructed by individual minds. Postmodernism argues against explanations that claim to be valid for all cultures, groups, races, etc suggesting that there should be a focus on the relative truth of each individual. Post-colonial insights place emphasis that the responses to minority discourses took place after the historical end of colonialism. At work, judgments are made about individuals from certain social categories and they influence intergroup relations. Stereotypes are seen as biased generalizations about a social group we may use our beliefs to guide our actions towards people from those groups. Stereotypes are learned or obtained by various means, such as our communication with parents and peers, or what we hear, see, or read in the media. Stereotyping, like any cognitive process once established, is difficult to change. Prejudice is often based on stereotypes and affects the way we think, communicate, and behave with others. Prejudice can take the form of disliking, fear, discomfort, and even hatred, the kind of affective states that can lead to negative behavior. In the workplace and in society, it's become evident that certain groups are the enduring victims of prejudice because they've been formed by the social categorization of individuals who have been historically discriminated against. Unconscious bias is a form of social stereotyping that occurs outside of individuals' consciousness about certain groups of people. These biases are influenced by the individual's background, cultural environment, personal experiences and interactions, and are triggered by our brains, making quick judgments and assessments of people and situations. 
Within the workplace, certain practices have been adopted to minimize the effects of unconscious bias on selection, recruitment, and promotion. For example, only using necessary job-related criteria in selection and evaluation. Discrimination is defined as what happens when someone who belongs to or is perceived to belong to a certain social group is treated less favorably because of the characteristics which associate themselves with that group. Discrimination can be direct or indirect and can appear in the form of harassment or victimization. Diversity as a field of study explores ways of understanding gender differences, ethnic heritage, disability status, and culture. It reflects on how people are seen as different from and similar to one another. It also considers the best ways to manage differences in order to improve creativity and innovation. Managing diversity seeks to develop proactive equal opportunity strategy that aims to eradicate conflicts, which can lead to injustice, discrimination, and exclusion at all levels. These different levels include individuals, organizations, and national contexts. In order for organizations to succeed, there has to be a comprehensive overview of the demographic characteristics of the workforce. Demographic characteristics influence the social construction of the workforce dynamic and are reflected in intergroup relations, working progression, and performance. In recent times, there's been a rise in the number of studies on age diversity. However, the effects on an aging workforce on an individual, group, and organizational outcomes aren't yet fully understood. Beyond the prevailing and still talked about diversity dimensions, which include gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and age, the ways in which differences are categorized are expanding. For instance, conversations around neurodiversity, which looks at the limitless aspects of the human neurocognitive functionalities like autism, dyslexia, and ADHD, are beginning to gain ground in the diversity discourse. Managing the diverse workforce needs more reflection and understanding. Theories originally developed in psychology and sociology help to reinforce our understanding of diversity. In providing a nuanced understanding of diversity management, the social identity theory, SIT, has emerged to capture the intersecting fields of diversity and psychology. Social identity theory explains how people see themselves and others, especially within a group structure. This theory characterizes individuals as having unique personalities influenced by affiliated groups. Social categorization refers to the different ways an individual can consider themselves to be similar to others, such as culture, profession, gender, or religion. Social categorization can enable faster integration of new employees. In an organizational setting where knowledge and information sharing can be part of culture of fostering collaboration and effective work, interactions between social categorizations can also lead to internal competition. While attempts to encourage different groups to view themselves as having a common identity can sometimes help improve relations, this can result in a negative response once it's seen as a means to get rid of meaningful subgroup identities. This is because individuals seek to continually and in a socially way define themselves, to have a sense of belonging, to have a purpose and direction in life, to feel powerful and relevant, and to have a sense of collective stability. People who are similar in race, ethnicity, and cultural heritage often draw on each other because of binding social norms that reinforce their identity and explain their distinctiveness. Consequently, organizations looking to attract and retain the best talent must create an organizational culture where individuals perceive the work environment to be compatible with their character or personality. Individuals look for organizations that create shared values, a sense of belonging, and a friendly work environment. As society continues to expand, forms of difference become embedded as part of the business ethos in managing diversity. This brings into perspective acculturation and inculturation, and how individuals' experiences influence the ways in which they react or adjust to new cultures. When an individual first encounters a new culture, this is the acculturation process. An individual begins to familiarize themselves and socialize with the norms of the new culture. They move into the inculturation phase. 
Likewise, when they become proficient in operating within the indigenous culture, we can say that integration is occurring. And if they absorb this culture, assimilation has occurred. However, if they're not interested or perceive resistance to their integration, they separate and finally marginalization occurs. Consequently, organizations need to pay attention to cultural behaviors, values, knowledge, and identities. Despite the challenges that can occur because of separation and marginalization or intergroup conflict, Cultural diversity has the propensity to increase creativity and innovation, as well as provide organizations with a wider talent pool. The challenge in managing cultural diversity in organizations is that it requires rigorous dialogue to promote flexibility and create systems that ensure individuals' cultural values are not silenced, but incorporated as part of organizational culture. Understanding diversity will continue to strengthen organizational management in the postmodern world.